the sun off your roof is free once the technology is cheap enough so you don't even care about the price. The wind off the side of your building is free. The geothermal heat under the ground of your building is free. The garbage that you convert to energy in your bioconverter is free. Jeremy Rifkin is econoom, politiek adviseur en energie-expert. Hij vertelt in het komend kwartier over de veranderende energiemarkt tijdens de derde industriële revolutie. Welkom bij Tegenlicht Talks. We now have a third industrial revolution infrastructure emerging that allows everyone to be their own entrepreneur. Think the internet. On the internet, everyone has to be entrepreneurial, whether they're contributing to a YouTube video or some text or software, or they're contributing to Wikipedia. Everyone's an entrepreneur. But their entrepreneurial capacity is only determined by their ability and willingness to be in deep collaborative networks. So everyone's an entrepreneur, but their success in being an individual entrepreneur is completely dependent on the collaborative relationships they make in deep social spaces. This is a real disruption. These developments are moving now, and what I'm saying to you is in the next 24 months, we're going to see the doors wide open around the world to this story. It's just about where the internet was around 1991 or two, when it went from being a small elite proposition among geeks and nerds to becoming a phenomena that captured the imagination and the attention of millions of people. That's right where we are now. The door is opening in Europe and Asia now. And we have a generation under the age of 35, everywhere they're starting to nod because it makes total sense. Here's a generation that grew up empowered to create their own information, very little cost. They're social entrepreneurial. They're involved in vast networks to share information uh, with each other around the world. For them, the idea that they can now use IT and internet technology to produce their own green energy and share some of it uh, across vast commons, energy internets that stretch across continents, this is an immediate hello for everyone under the age of 35. There's going to be a realization of how much energy cost the average family and the average business. The name of the game, and if there's anybody watching me right now this interview, if you're a small business or a medium-sized business or a large company, whether any company survives or fails in the Netherlands or anywhere in the world in the next 25 years, during this volatile transition where the old fossil fuel and nuclear energies are getting more expensive and the new renewable energies have to become cheaper and cheaper as they scale in, whether any company succeeds or fails will not depend on their labor costs. It's going to depend on the energy cost. What we now know, that we didn't know 30 years ago in economics, is that 85 percent, 84, 85 percent of all productivity gains are thermodynamic efficiencies, increasing the ability to produce more with less energy. Now, most people don't know that, so they, they see energy as just a fixed cost. It's expensive. They don't think about it. But if an average family in the Netherlands were to do an audit of the actual energy expenses they have for their electricity, their car, the taxes they pay, the energy embedded in the products they buy, the packaging material, they would be blown away at how much of their income goes to paying the energy cost in everything they purchase, from groceries at the store to petrol for the car, for electricity, for their air conditioning. What we are just now on is a cusp of awareness where the public begins to realize that energy is everything. Energy is actually what determines whether you're productive, make profit, or how much of your income is squandered. And when that happens, you're going to see a lot of people in the Netherlands are going to want their own power plant. Why would they want to be stuck in, um, in getting electricity where they have to pay a big tax on it, and then they have to rely on the price of oil and fossil fuels on world markets that shoot through the roof, or nuclear power that's too expensive? They can produce their own electricity. The sun off your roof is free once the technology is cheap enough so you don't even care about the price. The wind off the side of your building is free. 
The geothermal heat under the ground of your building is free. The garbage that you convert to energy in your bioconverter is free. So just as once the infrastructure was set up for the internet, the transaction costs are nearly free for everybody. How much does it cost for you to send your information to two billion people? When the internet joins with renewable energy and electrons become bits of information that are managed and millions of people are sharing just a little bit of their own energy, it dwarfs these little nuclear power plants and these little centralized coal-fired power plants, just like file sharing of music distributed dwarfed what you could do with centralized uh, production of music with CDs. Today, the kids uh, that are now sharing information, and now they're using the internet to share energy, they believe that by, by adding freely their contribution to a network, it benefits the network and then in all the individual players in the network. So today we have a whole generation of young people who consider themselves social entrepreneurs. That would also be considered an, entre an oxymoron in my generation. How can you be social and be entrepreneurial? Entrepreneurial is autonomous, individual agents seeking their self-interest against the other. It's a competitive war. It's caveat emptor. It's sellers and buyers beware. But for a young generation that's now sharing everything, they're sharing their automobiles and car parks, they're sharing their, uh, their travel and tourism and couch surfing, <laughs> they're, they're even sharing uh, 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 designer clothes and whatever, for them being social and entrepreneurial is not an oxymoron, it's a perfect fit. Before the internet emerged, nobody believed that they could do anything about uh, sending their own information and doing their own advertising, their own marketing or whatever. We just were passive audience. And we had to pay for everything uh, that came our way in terms of information. The internet changed all that. Now everybody feels completely comfortable with exchanging information with almost no transaction costs. It's almost free. And they can communicate to two and a half billion people with more power than the centralized TV networks, and every person could do that. We did that in 25 years with the internet. Uh, as powerful as that is, the next part of the story is when the internet joins with distributed renewable energies, and we envision hundreds of millions of people generating their own green electricity. Solar off the roof, wind off the side walls of the building, geothermal heat underneath the building, garbage converted energy. This empowers people. The reason people are powerless in the world is literal. They have no power. 20% of the human race lives on under $2 a day and has no electricity, never had any electricity. Another 25% of the human race has minimum access to electricity. It's sporadic. It's unpredictable. That's the best we could do with centralized elite energies like fossil fuel and nuclear power. It wasn't too good. Now, we have to envision that right now there's several million uh, now there's several million buildings producing their own power. 25 years from now, hundreds of millions of buildings will be producing some of their own power. And then this changes the ball game. This is power to the people. Well, it's interesting because in the initial stages, we're, this is what we call prosumers. In the initial stages, there will be thousands of companies that can create the more sophisticated products. There will be millions of consumers who can just pop out their own products, for sure. But there will be more sophisticated products that require more complicated software, and you're going to have to have many manufacturers do that. And what this means is that you democratize uh, the manufacturing process, you're using your own local power, you're marketing on internet sites for almost free, and your logistics is all locally powered by your own green electricity. It allows thousands of mini manufacturers to manufacture for regional markets at a much smaller cost than traditional centralized factories that had to scale top down because of the high price of electricity and energy. It's a sea change. Now, what will happen to big companies? A lot of them will disappear. Some of them will not. The ones that stay in this third industrial revolution will transform themselves from uh, their initial role, their traditional role, of manufacturing the products or the services to a new role of being aggregators of networks. What they'll help in a logistical sense is aggregate vast networks, value chains, supply chains, and work hand-to-hand -hand 
with small and medium-sized enterprises and producer cooperatives who will do a lot of the manufacturing and servicing. So it'll be a more even playing field between big companies who are aggregated in networks but have to rely on thousands of small companies who come together in producer cooperatives so they have a lot of power as well. It flattens capitalism. We call this distributed capitalism. In a sense, it's actually a little bit beyond capitalism and socialism because it takes the best of both and, and leaves the worst behind. With the third industrial revolution, everyone's an entrepreneur. So that's the best of the market. Take a risk, be an entrepreneur, be creative. But one's success depends on being in deep, collaborative social networks, the best of socialism, solidarity. So it takes the best features of both, but it eliminates the centralizing features of the marketplace, winner take all, and the centralizing features of the state, where the state becomes big brother and takes care of all of you, and then nobody has incentives to be individually entrepreneurial. So it's quite an interesting change, really. Let me, let me give you one example of how this changes for industry and then government. Completely new business models will emerge. For example, power and utility companies, when we introduced this early on, weren't too happy. Obviously, the energy companies weren't happy at all. That's not, I don't worry that much about it. But the power and utility companies, they said, we don't like this. We like, to have, we like to generate the power, distribute it to the end user, and sell a lot of electricity, end of story. We said, look, get used to it. The model's changing. Think file sharing and music. Think the blogosphere and the newspapers. Right now, there are millions of people producing a little bit of their own green electricity in their buildings. 10 years from now, tens of millions of people. 25 years from now, around the world, hundreds of millions of buildings producing their own green electricity. We, the people, through our producer cooperatives, SME associations, we'll sell the energy back to you, the utility company. You can run the energy internet, but we'll have to make sure it's totally open, like the internet, and there's a, uh, supervisory authorities in every country, so you can't play games. How do you make money? We say to the utility company, the way you're gonna make money in a third industrial revolution is by selling as little electricity as you can sell. And then they do what you do, they raise their eyebrow. What are you, crazy? There's far more money to be made in the utility companies helping manage energy and having their clients share the productivity gains back in shared savings agreements than selling electrons. Many utility companies will not make this move. They just can't grasp it. If we really look back through history, the whole narrative of history, we see that the great changes in human consciousness happen when new energy revolutions converge with communication revolutions. They not only change the economic paradigm, but they actually change consciousness. Because when communication energy comes together, the communication is like the nervous system for the organism. The energy is like the blood. And so when they come together, they create the possibility of bigger social organisms, larger units in which people can come together and engage in social activity as extended selves. What's interesting is when communication energy revolutions converge and merge, they annihilate time and space, bring more people together, and they broaden the notion of sociability. Now, on the third industrial revolution, we're on the cusp of this new communication energy matrix, the internet converging with renewable energies, whole continents in the world connected, and our kids are now moving to a larger, a larger community, the biosphere. So they're not giving up their European loyalties or their national identities or their uh, religious identities or their blood ties, but now we've got a younger generation because of the internet and renewable energy mix, we're annihilating time and space again. So we're beginning to see a shift again in empathy. Empathy is the invisible hand in history that allows us to show solidarity in broader and broader social units and actually physiologically experience another as if they were us. The next stage is to finally acknowledge that the human family writ large is our family, the biosphere is our community, our fellow creatures are our evolutionary relatives, and that's the only way we're gonna survive. We will not make it into a third industrial revolution just with the technology. We have to shift the biosphere consciousness. So let me end on this. I'm guardedly hopeful.